Okay, let's just use the pulpit mic. That's great. Thank you, Daniel. It is a wonderful hallelujah that we bring to this time. Thank you, choir. I invite us all now to enter into the beautiful word. Thank you, Sherry, for saying that and lifting it up. It is a beautiful word we've been given with a word of prayer. Lord, may the words that you put on my heart and on my lips and the meditation of all of our hearts gathered in this place this day be acceptable in your sight for you are our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank you all for helping me celebrate the day of my birth earlier this week. It's so wonderful to be a part of a caring congregation who celebrates with me year after year as I age right before your eyes. Birthdays do give us an opportunity to reflect on what life has given you. And as I studied the scripture for this morning and uh, had it coincide with my birthday, I had to pause to, to really thank God in particular for my birth family, my family of origin, who taught me how important it was to be a part of a family of faith such as you all. Most of you have met my mom and dad, and some of you, the Rosemont Row and Julia and, and Kay, know my paternal grandparents, Bill Sr. and Bernice Badgett Morgan. I don't think any of you had the opportunity to meet my maternal grandparents, parents, Fred and Altamod Baker, who resided most of their years in Sugarland, Texas. Both branches of my family tree were heavily laden with the fruits of the Spirit, nourished by a belief in Jesus Christ so thoroughly that I can't help but think that faith was woven into our DNA. I suppose it's easy to understand then about a conversation I had with both of my grandmothers on separate occasions. Both sat down with me to share their concerns about the spiritual well-being of their grandchildren, including me. You see, they were very much aware of the decline in attendance in their churches, that culture was becoming more secular, and that the traditions that our family had practiced and held dear for years and years were not seen as important as it was to them. And it broke my grandmother's hearts. I don't know if it's because I was the minister of the family, but in one-on-one -on -one hushed conversations, each of my grandmothers shared with me their agony, and that is the word I can only bring to this, the agony about whether they would see their beloved children and grandchildren in heaven. Would they be saved? This was not an academic or theoretical, theological discussion. This was about real life and wanting the best for their beloved family members. This was about eternity. And I'm guessing my grandmothers were not alone. That maybe there are some of you here today who harbor the same concerns about your beloved family members and the generations that are to come. This is what the Apostle Paul was wrestling throughout his letter to the Romans, his concern and his anguish about his family. 
Now, you might not get that reading the first eight chapters of this letter to the Romans. Paul presents a rather academic, apologetic for his own identity shift from persecutor of Christians to the apostle of the good news of Jesus Christ. And he's trying to explain it to his family laid out in a logical, rhetorical style that culminates in the very last few verses of chapter 8, where we hear this beautiful, familiar scripture when Paul proclaims, I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation shall be able to separate us from the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's it's as if in writing these words, Paul opens up his heart and all the feelings that have been kept in while he was doing this logical, mental explanation to his family, the feelings now come pouring out, and he's emotional because he's concerned about those he loves. Now, we in the Christian tradition, we're familiar with the practice of calling one another brother and sister, aren't we? Brother, brother Lily. We don't do that as much anymore, though. We don't refer to one another familiarly as much, but it is, it is a part of the Christian tradition. But in Paul's family faith of origin, there really were bloodlines connected. As Allison showed our kids, his faith traces their DNA, their genetic connection, all the way back to Abraham and Sarah several generations removed. And unlike his other letters, which were addressed to the burgeoning new churches of his day, made up mainly of Gentiles, the letter to the Romans spends a lot of time speaking to his estranged Jewish kinfolk who could not or would not claim Jesus as Messiah the Messiah for whom they've been waiting. And and he implores in verse 1 of today's reading that that he's telling them the truth and that he brings to them a witness in the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 3 is when he cries out in anguish, I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. If there were any way I could be cursed, and cut off from the joy I found in Christ so that you could believe I would do it in a minute. You're my family. I grew up with you. We've had everything going for us in the family. Chosenness, glory, covenants, revelation, worship, promises, to say nothing of the race that produced the Messiah. The Christ who is God over everything, everywhere. Hallelujah! Amen. Paul is yearning for his family to affirm the trajectory that he now understands is God's will. He is not negating the faith of his fathers and mothers. He's celebrating it. And he believes his ancestors were chosen to be the servant people Just like Isaiah said in chapter 49, verse 6, I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. But but Paul is is saying, but, but Christ came to kind of put us right back on the right track. And it was this Christ corrective that shook his world the foundations of his own faith, and brought him to a new understanding of what it means to be a child of God's promise. 
In verse 6 he said, don't suppose for a moment that God's word malfunctioned. The problem is not with God or God's word. It's with a misunderstanding that goes way back. It's not about Abraham's DNA, he said, but it's about the promise that God gave to Abraham. It was never connected to bloodline, but spirit line in the promise. It's not blood that connects us as family. It is a spirit that extends out to people of all bloodlines. That's what it means to be a child of the promise. And Paul wrote, it doesn't depend on human desire or effort, but that spirit depends on God's mercy, God's grace. Paul, Paul knew that firsthand about the grace of God through Jesus Christ. He had lived it on the road to Damascus where he was literally kicked out of his old life and, and thrown into a new one. He was literally kicked out of his old name Saul when he heard Jesus say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he was, he was pushed into, really, he walked through a closed and chained gate that became unchained and he became free, free to live a life that was no longer about judging others with misunderstood laws. He was freed from his old identity as Saul to become a new person because of Jesus. And he was renamed Paul, which in the Latin comes from the word Paulus, which means humbled. Humble. Paul was humbled by the invitation of Jesus Christ to understand what it means to be free as a child of the promise. And it was that freedom that made him giddy with joy, and he wanted to share it with everyone. He wanted his family to understand that freedom. It was difficult for them all to hear it in the same way that Paul heard it. Because they had grown up believing that their faith was the only way, the only truth, the only life. And so when Paul began to, to share so about Jesus, it, it just sounded so different to their ears. It smacked of heresy. It smacked of blasphemy. Many of them turned their hearts and their backs on Paul and thought at best he was that harmless, crazy cousin and at worst a danger that needed to be imprisoned. We, we can't be too harsh on them because Paul was not harsh on them. Oh, there are times in his letter it sounds pretty, pretty cruel. <laughs> but he goes back to share with them why it was it was so wonderful for him. He was planting seeds of promise and hoping that they would come to fruition, knowing that people sometimes take a while to change. Throughout history, people have refused to believe that with which they don't want to believe, despite the evidence. When explorers first went to Australia, for instance, they found a mammal that laid eggs, that swam in the water or walked on land, and it had a, a broad, flat tail, and it had webbed feet, and a bill similar to a duck. So you can imagine when the explorers went back to their homeland, to England, and they told the populace about this animal that they found, <laughs> they thought they were crazy, that they were trying to perpetrate a hoax. 
So they went back to Australia and they found a pelt from this animal and they took it back to England and still, even though they saw it, they did not believe it because their minds had been ingrained about what was true. Now a duck-billed platypus, which can be seen, is not the same thing as our faith in God through Jesus Christ, which can only be seen in the eyes of the beholder. Even Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. But Paul did his best to be consistent and insistent with that promise that salvation is not ours to dispense nor to inherit. It is a gift of grace by God to each and every one. So therefore, brothers and sisters, leave the judgment in God's, goods hand, God's good hands and follow the role model of Jesus Christ as we live one another in love and feel free. And just in case you need a little help, because Paul always knew we needed a little help about what that looked like. In Romans chapter 12, he, he gives us a checklist, and it's a long one. So I'm just going to read the first part of the thing. So you can hear it. Romans chapter 12, you can get your pencils and check it off yourself. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. That is your spiritual act of worship. First, love must be sincere, genuine. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted, be devoted to one another in familial love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people in need, practice hospitality, and on and on and on. It just seems so simple to Paul, so obvious, and he wanted everyone, especially his beloved family members of his faith, to experience the freedom and the joy in that freedom through Jesus Christ. That is what he wanted for the children of the promise. And that's really what my grandmothers wanted for all of us too. They wanted us to know what it's like to be a part of a faith that gives hope, that gives support, that gives direction, that sustains. They wanted all of their children and grandchildren to know that love of Jesus Christ. So if I could talk to my grandmothers again and in our one-on-one -on -one hushed conversations, let them know that, yeah, even though we all do not practice in the same way that they would have wanted us to, still, they did a great job planting the seeds of promise that we are all connected by the love of Jesus Christ, the Creator God who made us all, and that we're still growing in the Spirit. And there's hope for all of us yet. This is the good news from the Apostle Paul for the people of God this day. We've got a lot of work ahead of us, don't we? Because we get to plant the seeds. For Reese, you hear him back there. And for all of our children. For Troy. For all our kiddos, what fun we're going to have. Let us pray. May we not only be children of your promise, O oh God, but also sowers of the seeds of promise in our children. 
May we trust in you to guide us in all that we say and do and celebrate this joyful freedom that we have found through Jesus Christ our Lord. It is in his name that we pray this day. Amen. If there